Hello and welcome to the Nausicast. The Nausicast is where we go through each movie made by Studio Ghibli in release order and we discuss our analysis and research findings. And this time around, uh, not much to be found in terms of research findings, but I hope we can make up for it in terms of analysis. With me today are my friends and co-hosts, Hipster Cthulhu. Hey, it's your neighbor, the Norsecast. Oh wait, we already we already did that. Yeah, should have, should have been more original with these titles, Ghibli. <laughs> Unbelievable. And Platon Skull. Yes, we will uh, g- uh, get through this one uh, like a ship crew going through uh, treacherous water, or something like that. Yes, and the thunder. We're like one big happy family here. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Hello, the Thunderer. Okay, um, yes, as you've maybe guessed by the jokes and by the title when you clicked on this podcast, we're talking about My Neighbors Day Amadas today, a film released in 1999, directed by our um, now, again, returning uh, director, uh, Isao Takahara. Um, before we get really into the meat of what this movie is and what it's all about, first, a couple of words. First, uh, we had a bit of a long pause between Mononoke Hime and this one, um, I would say this is partially due to how much of a research effort went into Mononoke Hime and how much stress we've had between then and now, or me particularly. I don't even know if you, any of you had that much stress, but I sure had. Yes, the semester started and yeah. all that. Yeah. All, all that nasty stuff. And finally, we've heard your calls, we've heard your voices, and we've put a bit of, I mean... A bit of effort into getting this this here podcast onto the popular streaming sites like Spotify, iTunes, uh, your podcasting app of choice because it's it's Libsyn. It's it's Libsyn. If you if you don't know, it's Nausicast with double A dot Libsyn dot com. Um, this is where you can find a podcast feed of our podcast. You can use it in any of your apps. You can download it. You can listen to it online. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, and so on. It is not up to date as of yet because, and and this is quite annoying to get into as an as a as an already existing podcast to get hosted on such a website because they give you a monthly upload uh, uh, cap. And of course, having more than just two episodes, we filled that up quite uh, quickly. So up. Until this point, we only are up to Porco Rosso in terms of what's on this podcasting side. But every month, we're going to add new ones as soon and, and soon we will be caught up. Um, so for the old episodes, go to the Libsyn link, listen to it in your favorite podcasting app. For the new episodes, you'll be stuck with the MP3 download link in the video description for a while longer. And you've already known this. It's still true. It's incredible. MP3 downloads in the description. Okay, let's get to the movie. <laughs> Yes, directed by Isao Takahara, 1999, and uh, the first uh, uh, digitally animated uh, film from Studio Ghibli. Um, unlike uh, Princess Mononoke, which yeah, w- w- which uh, used uh, a-, a lot of CG and key sequences, but like the th- th- this one is digitally animated uh, through and through. Yeah, from 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 every single frame, no cell animation to be found here. In Mononoke, we often had to like, yeah. this is a digital exactly. In in Mononoke, we talked about how they used, for example, digital effects to make multiple like uh, um, elements on screen slide and pan and distort when like, like there was a heavy motion scene happening. This is like one of the big advantages of digital. But here we can explore a different, interesting, and uh, at that time new advantage for digital uh, anime making, and it is that Takahara intended to have this um, this movie represent more closely the style of the original Yonkoma manga, which it is based on. Just to quickly explain what a Yonkoma is, it is a four-panel comic strip-like thing, and this particular one was in a very popular big newspaper, running for, like, what, forever, basically. It was a very famous, like, a household name in Japan, because it was, like, I don't know, like, the newspaper comic strips, like a Garfield type of thing, or, or Dilbert, or, you know, those kinds. I've actually never a read Dilbert. Peanuts. Peanuts. Is Peanuts a, 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 a newspaper comic strip? Yeah. Okay, okay, never, never knew this. I don't know all these American comic strips. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm European, if you can tell. Uh, <laughs> but no, to get back to it, uh, Takahara wanted to capture the style of that original manga, so he opted to have something that he could make look like watercolor backdrops and like pa- pa- 
how should I put it, like pencil painted like characters that would retain like the sense of the tool with which they have been drawn. Takahara explicitly talked about the idea that he wanted it to retain this grittiness of the drawing itself. Yeah. And to have this animate, you couldn't just use the traditional paint on cell techniques. So he went full digital. Much to a, a resistance from Miyazaki's side, by the way, who I think at the time was, what was it, on vacation for a while or retirement, actually. And Takahara yeah. was like, okay, let's go with it. <laughs> let's go. He's yeah. not here. He can't. <laughs> they, 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 <laughs> yeah, they, 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 they they had to replace the entire one of the main animation rooms entirely with computers, and that really did not sit well with um, yeah. Miyazaki. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, it didn't. You're saying Miyazaki was a uh, kind of hostile to new technologies. I mean, it is funny yeah, how how much of a luddite he can be at moments when actually it is <laughs> so incredible how much innovation he also uses in his films and how we can trace the history of new technologies and yeah. animation as they arise through these Ghibli movies as well. So I'm really happy that we have this added side effect, just having this podcast about Ghibli, but also being able to talk about all the cool new tech that they find and develop and use. It's good. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, like, like, like uh, as, as I understand it, like uh, Ghibli, they're not like the pioneers of the yeah, techniques, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but, but they are often the first to master them mm. uh, in Japan. And this movie is a real, real great feat in terms of blending, um, of course, all digital art, which is very usual, typical nowadays, because all anime after, I don't know, 2002 will be, I guarantee you, not made traditionally with that cell animation, but digitally. So in this case, um, pioneering, or not pioneering, but really excellently exercising a technique which is now commonplace but also they do something which i found is not quite as commonplace in 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 today's anime uh, production which is to really almost seamlessly blend cg into the scenes because and, and not just cg but also rotoscoping so there were rotoscoped scenes where uh, if, if it's not clear what rotoscoping is it's when you take like live action footage or cg footage and you draw over every frame, which gives us like a gritty and scribbled look a little bit, but very fluid animation. Um, there's a ton of Western animation also, which experiments with rotoscoping. Um, cue someone who knows a film and can uh, uh, hit us with an example. <laughs> I believe the, uh, the, yeah, the uh, 80s Lord of the Ring movies used a lot of robot rotoscoping. Yeah. Yeah, uh, oh, also, yeah, yeah of, of, of course, there's also... Um, uh, Richard Linklater, I, I think, made the first entirely rotoscoped uh, animated film, uh, which is a Waking Life, uh, which is also like mid late nineties. Um, also did a Scanner Darkly that is all oh, rotoscoped. Uh, oh yeah, I, I was wrong. It's uh, it's, it's two thousand one, so, so it's a couple of years later. And a Scanner Darkly came later, yeah. which like refined a lot of the techniques, mm. but but like that that, that was like a sort of a, uh, innovation, uh, and and of course. Rotoscoping has been like a commonplace uh, technique in animation since the very first animated feature film, yeah, which is Snow absolutely. White. Yeah, it's yeah. A, like, like, and you can definitely like tell when a character is rotoscoped and when yeah. uh, when they're not in those old Disney films. Yeah, like uh, to, to just just watch Snow White uh, mm. like uh, dancing together with uh, with, with the dwarves, and it's uh, it's clear as day. Yeah, the technique is very old. But uh, I was impressed by the seamless blend of everything in this movie. And I also wanted to talk about the CG a little bit because we have a handful of scenes where, I mean, you can kind of tell that it's CG because the camera is rapidly panning and you see all these details emerging. They use CG, but like with an interesting shader that approximates like the pencil kind of or the, 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 the crayon drawing outlines of the art itself, of the characters and so on. So it really blends quite well in a way that is not as disruptive or disorienting as many uses of CG in more contemporary anime productions that can often range from they tried to use some kind of cell shading to make it look more anime to absolutely this is just a video yeah. game bear attacking your anime person. What is happening? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they used the same technique they used with Mononoke where they like had the CG rendered but then they like animated over top yeah. of it. They like I, got the animators to trace everything so it like yeah. blended perfectly in with the, the film. They haven't for this film but, uh, I, at least as far as my eyes could tell. Uh, I'm pretty sure I've, I've seen like the little imperfections that would come from it being still computer generated but like often you have of course this technique as well which is like you generate the CG scene, the CG animation and then draw over it with rotoscoping. So that's also how you can use rotoscoping mm. not just over live action footage but also CG generated monsters and whatnot yeah but 
But but while this movie um, has like all these wonderful like techniques and really well done, it, it was it was a real strain on the studio to make it. Like basically everyone, all these traditional animators had to learn how to use computers, had to learn to do digital animation, had to learn to just draw like like. Um, there was, there was, I, I, I heard a, um, one interviewer I heard would ask, ask us questions. Like, um, what do you think, what was this kind of sketchy art style we were going for? He's like, yeah, he, had to, he would have to correct them to tell them to draw things less detailed and draw closer to the storyboard because the animators wanted to, like, you know, because <laughs> they're, they're used to, they're, they're Ghibli animators. They've been trained to, like, make the most beautiful, like, detailed, descriptive works, like, pictures they can. And they were, there's, Tak Hunters, like, refused to let them do anything like that yeah and uh, and like the movie went like way way over time and over budget um i think it cost me, like <laughs> over two like around like two and a half billion yen um which it didn't um, make back because it was a kind no. of a box office flop and i think it's the first uh ghibli movie since i don't know since maybe it is the first ghibli movie to not break even at the box office i think there was something like that yeah yeah the, the, I, I think that's correct like some some of the earlier stuff like what wasn't as big uh hits as like yeah. uh as we've become used to, but but yeah, I I believe you're right. Yeah, it came in the same season as the Phantom Menace and as um the first <laughs> and as the and as the first Pokemon movie, so there was a lot of um a lot of competition at the box office at that time. Yeah, 1999 was a hell of a movie. Yeah, in general. To imagine um, like a, like a family trying to decide whether or not to go watch the Phantom Menace <laughs> and my name is Yamada is so weird to me. Yeah, it's also yeah. I think it's also the same thing as the the Sixth Sense. Uh, and uh, Fight Club is also 1999, uh, American Beauty. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a, a, a hell of a movie, yeah. Yeah, but um, um, also, but also after this, because this production was so troubled and fraught, um, he was uh, Takato was basically banned from making any more movies with Ghibli for until Kaguya, which is uh, Ka- Kaguya Hime, which is um, how many years from that? It's it's uh, four, 14, 14 years, years yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, 14 years. But uses yeah. a ton of the same tech in, in, in a sense. Like if we think about like a relation between those two, Kagrahima has also has like the, all these sprawling watercolor backdrops and like the figures like yeah, being yeah, scrawled yeah. and painted. Yeah, and, you, can, you yeah. can see the beginnings of, the, of, of that style here. There are also some like uh, key sequences where like it, uh, like the, the way the art style like it, it changes, the way the brush strokes uh, changes in certain mm. scenes. You can, you can, uh, that's even like a straight up reference to the tale, the, the actual fairy tale yeah. of the Princess Kaguya. Oh yeah, in, yes. In in the movie, in in like the big uh, like fantastical uh, dream Monogatari. sequence representing the family in the beginning. Yeah, of the, the birth. I also of think the it's children. interesting that the uh, the style is also very reminiscent of all the memory sequences from Only Yesterday. Yes. But like is... Takahata always loved those oh, like yeah, water painted the... minimalist backdrops mm. with like huge yeah. amounts of negative space. Yeah, and I guess we really need to comment on this as well because yeah, in only yesterday we've seen this like we've had Grave of the Fireflies, bleak, very realistic to to a painful extent. We talked about in our Grave cast and in our Totoro cast about how there's a distinction between how landscapes and nature and backgrounds are depicted in those two films. Like the the, the there we highlighted the bleak realism to Grave of the Fireflies. Then we go to only yesterday specifically juxtaposing um, the watercolor memories and the uh, more realistic i i want to say gritty but also like vibrant and filled with life like scenes that are clearly supposed to be realism we talk extensively about how even the animation of like the facial expressions and the lip syncing there was a ton of realism in the consideration of how things were to be animated and then of course pompoko goes a step into the fantastical and now we're just completely uh, uh into let's have no trace of realism at least in terms of the aesthetics left and depict everything as this extremely um i want to say like uh abstracted like cartoonish simplified style like this is uh yeah. kind of like a huge change for takahara we could go into the movies takahara made before he was part of studio ghibli those were also overwhelmingly marked by realism except for i guess uh the the panda Panda shots he did with miyazaki yeah, but, and I, I think it's absolutely fascinating to to look at the it, it it's such a stark difference between the the, the two like champion directors of uh, Studio yeah. Ghibli that once uh, once Miyazaki um, like uh, adopted digital animation he uh, used it mainly to um, to 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 create even more like a, a beautiful and un uh, and otherworldly effects uh, especially but like stuck to the same like drawing style and uh and and, and like kept a consistent aesthetic throughout uh isao takahara when he gets 
these uh these tools he starts like doing weird stuff with with it like like really like changing it up and uh and like uh doing something completely different uh that that, that wouldn't really be f- as feasible with uh, traditional cell yeah. animation well, I, I, and I, um and I think part part of that is uh, because like Miyazaki is like the artist in uh, in, in his films. He he is the like key animator uh, and, and like the the guiding voice during the art. Takahata is like director yeah. first and foremost. I mean, it's not just he's director first and foremost. Takahata literally couldn't draw. Um, yeah, he's. I mean, he studied French literature in college, and to talk, uh, <laughs> Miyazaki just got to study painting. Like, <laughs> it's very yeah, th- like, yeah that's a. <laughs> Yeah, I think you can, pretty much you can pick out kind of almost like a philosophical divide between them in these styles in which Miyazaki's style is that of having an incredibly rich and realistic world in which fantastic things happen. Like all of his planes feel like properly designed, even they're like ludicrously like physics wise. Or Takahata likes this way more like subjective, weird thing like all the sequences in Only Yesterday or in in Pompoko where the illusions of the Tanuki keep on like melding into real life and the memories of them. And now in this movie where like you have um, them start on their marriage and it's this weird metaphor as they go like around a bobsled onto a cake and it's all these like wacky transitions. And then Kaguya, which is like a complete fairy tale portraying everything in like this water painted, like a completely illusory way almost. Yo. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, and 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 to like, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give the movie this. It's like uh, technically, it's uh, it's fascinating and it's uh, and it's kind of beautiful to look at, especially in motion. It's exceptionally well animated. Like, yeah, not, I, not, I think not this just, movie's it, super ambitious and interesting. Yeah, no, in a lot not of in ways. the way where like, yeah, yeah, but not, not in the way where like there's a bunch of like, oh, look at look at this insane Sakuka sequence. Though there are you, there are a couple of those, um, but 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 it's just like um in the way it's minimalist in the same way that the art style is but like that that's really difficult like to animate something and to like be very particular about what moves and how to to like maximize appeal and i think i think it does this really really well yeah i think there's like really interesting animation cuts throughout the whole movie where typically when you watch an anime with very simplified style like this you usually get like maybe some wacky scenes where it goes all over the top, but otherwise it's like very basic movement because that's kind of what the style is built around. But in this, yeah, the, even though the, the character designs like are very basic, the animation is like never limited. Like everything feels like properly real. Even the way the car moves, it's like a crude, like four line drawing of a car, but it like moves yeah. with proper weight. Like when someone like moves a cup or something and like the sound effects and like the way it's animated, it's all like completely real even though it's this very abstracted style to the point where yeah. i'd say it's almost like i don't want to say it's a juxtaposition because i don't think that is it but it's just this very noticeably like strange and in-depth style for something that's so cartoonish yeah. which i think is maybe yeah. he's into the movie trying to be like this very down to earth story about a family while still being like more of an abstracted idea of a family I I, uh, I, th- I kind of want to like highlight the animation here because um I looked at the staff listing um and I, I I found some interesting names and I guess relations to other works where those animators have worked on that I just kind of want to point out here. Um, one uh, of the most important influences of the movie animation style, of course, is the animation director Kenichi Konishi, who uh has his first position as animation director here, but he would later go on to be also the animation director on Kaguya Hime, Millennium Actress. Tokyo Godfather, so two Satoshi Kon movies, and uh, Kaiju no Kodomo, or Children of the Sea, which I have not seen yet, actually. That's, that's, I should watch that. Yeah. But, and all, all, all those movies kind of share this kind of abstract representation of reality, which right. is interesting. Exactly. They, they all do, yeah. <laughs> and all of them, like, I mean, I would say, like, especially Millennium Actress is, like, really fluid in how uh, the world and uh, uh, areas and motion through those is depicted. Same as this movie, by the way, because we have a couple of scenes where, like, for example, where the, the father walks to those uh, biker gang guys, and then suddenly the style shifts and we are completely in rotoscoping. And um, um, it has this, like, really gritty realism to it. But I guess here's where I would... Um, um, put the next name that is on my list because it's Masaaki Yuasa. Masaaki Yuasa on key animation in this one. And I'm sure we've seen uh, um, 
his influence on especially like the rotoscoping scene because rotoscoping yeah. is a technique he heavily used in his movies uh, like uh, 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 what's a mind game yeah like the, the flying scene at the end of the movie seems very similar to the flying scene at the end of mind game yeah in terms so, of, and, they, and they, they both serve a similar structural purpose as well yeah and I'll have to say well, I think, it also makes yeah. sense they hired him since he worked on Shin Shan for exactly. like many years Shin Shan so has it, like it's, it's no wonder yeah exactly this crayon style kind of yeah. like that they're trying to go for but also, like, uh, um, USA also then turned out to be kind of one of the masters of animating abstract or simple characters. Like, mm. his most famous work, I think, would be Tatami Galaxy. And uh, in Tatami Galaxy, you have those extremely flat drawings of characters that are really abstract, really... Uh, they can really... What's it called? Be deformed. They can really be deformed in terms of animation. And they have also this, like... Um, Extremely expressive animations through very abstract character art. So, yeah, this is a connection that I really enjoyed figuring out here. Just one of Masaki Yuasa's first big key animation roles outside of like Shin Shan at the time. Yeah. And it, it is just, I didn't even know that Yuasa worked with Studio Ghibli at times well, of his career. Um, Taka, Takahata, I know, hired a lot of outside animators for this movie because Studio Ghibli just was not equipped to deal with it. Yeah. So that's, I, that, 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 that makes sense. And another animator we find on this that I just found worth highlighting because we'll encounter him a lot more later in our journey through the Ghibli movies is Yonobayashi. Hiromasa Yonobayashi is on here as an in-between animator. Of course, like we know in-betweening is uh, more or less like a like a task you give very inexperienced uh, animators so like they fill out between two keyframes the additional frames when you just start in a studio you get to do these tasks Yonobayashi has also been working on Mononoke Hime doing exactly this but also in the meantime I didn't know this but Yonobayashi was a key animator on Serial Experiments Lane <laughs> hmm. and that 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 really surprised me and that was in between his work on Mononoke Hime and his work on um, 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 My Neighbors the Yamadas so yeah Yonobayashi, we will encounter this name later because he will return not only as an animator on repeated films, but also as a director. One of the uh, other few director that, directors we will be talking about in the course of this podcast because there isn't many uh, directors for Ghibli movies, but he's one of them. So um, now that we've talked about what there is to talk about in terms of this production or rather what we could gather from and there were really not many resources for us to do our research with. Um, I think like Thundra even needed to resort to taking French sources into account so that we even have like anything <laughs> to go to go off of. <laughs> so yeah, this is this is like the production tech and uh, and, and general stuff context that we managed to gather. So now let's just get get to the movie, like what it's about, how what what, what we thought of it, what our impressions were, just to get it like straight out of the gate. I know yeah. we usually aren't. I go about it in a bit of a different way, but I think for this one, it makes sense to do it like this. So, uh, Peyton, I heard you, you want to go right ahead and yes, uh, yeah. So, so, so the it's a uh, like like mentioned earlier, it's 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 based on a, a, a young coma a gag manga, basically basically a, like a, a newspaper a strip. And it's structured kind of like one. Um, it's uh, it, it's pretty much just a series of uh, vignettes spanning like m maybe a year, maybe like a few months, at least a few seasons of this uh, uh, family's life. We have uh, the father, we have the mother, we have the um, like uh, like uh, early teen son and uh, the uh, little uh, little kid uh, daughter, and uh, the uh, the grandma uh, who is. I I I believe uh, she's the uh, the dad's mom. No, I believe it's the uh, mother's mom. Right, the mother's mom because she's she's uh always like uh like kind of has a weird rivalry going with with the dad. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh and they they, they all li live together. The dad's a salary man. Uh, the mom is a housewife. Uh, and that that's uh and, and that we pretty much just see a bunch of like uh little uh little small gags. Small vignettes, uh, at times loosely structured around. Okay, now we're focusing more on the dad and his like uh, work uh, and life balance, and uh, and now we focus a bit more on uh, on the teenage son and uh, and and his like uh, girl uh, troubles and stuff like that. Uh, and there are a few like really out there sequences, uh, like an extended sequence at the beginning, which we talked about earlier. 
in, in which we we see a flashback to the the parents their uh, their wedding and uh, and an old relative who uh, gives like a speech about like how how they are going to face the challenges ahead and we see a whole sequence of them in a bobsled uh, transforming into like a a, a a boat into um a weird like uh all terrain vehicle uh, through a forest and and uh, some allusions to some fairy tales it, it it really like goes out there there's late there's a sequence where the dad imagines himself as like a superhero riding a scooter and saving the family and like uh near that like at the end of the film there's also uh an, an extended like um musicals uh sequence where they all like fly through the air like carrying um, umbrellas um but like the 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 really like kind of interesting uh, part of it is that it's so loosely structured it it, it barely has like a, any type of traditional structure um yeah and I thought that that's was probably also why it, it it didn't really do very well at the box office there's very little to like uh to grab onto and and the aesthetics aren't uh, like they are technically impressive and really well put together f- uh, for what they they are and what they try to do but like it's not so like it's not as aesthetically mind blowing to look at as uh, as, as some other films. Could yeah, be. I I thought the uh, the structure was definitely the most like interesting or like at least like the weirdest thing because I can't think of like any other movie or at least another anime movie structured like this. It's truly bizarre because also kind of for reference, I would say when it comes to four coma uh, adaptations into anime, there's usually kind of like two schools of thought where one is like a straight just random skits, skits put together in an episode, kind of like a like Nietzsche Joe would be a good example of how that's mm. done, where like it's just no context. Or you would do it uh, similar to I guess uh, Asamanga Dio would be a good example where okay. they uh, they try to build more of a, a plot and like yeah, cohesive narrative it. throughout one episode by using the different skits, and they even add a few little extra scenes to connect them all. But Yamada's feels like a weird compromise between both. Because like at the towards the beginning of the movie, we get almost like a twelve minute long sequence that feels like a, like what would be like an episode, or like the first half, of like a an Urusei Yatsura episode where there's a whole thing where they lose the the daughter and then they go like running around. But then like nothing like that really appears again, except maybe a bit near like the end of the film. There's like slightly longer sequences. So this this movie's just like all over the place with like any kind of like narrative ideas and just having things pop in. Some segments will last like four seconds for like one gag. But then others will like go on repeatedly for a bit. Yeah. Now that you say it, it reminds me actually of the structure of something like Lucky Star because you have a kind of a framing in Lucky Star, but most episodes consist of like loosely thematically, maybe thematically tied together gags or individual scenes. And I mean, this is also the most you're gonna get out of this movie, right? We have sometimes have like a headline that pops up, and then you have like more one or two or three scenes in a row that will all relate to like one general idea, like patriarchal supremacy restored will be displayed on screen and then you will have like three gags where the where the husband cannot get the attention of his family or something hmm. yeah adolescence and then just uh, a few scenes with the kid uh with with the boy yeah. you know the boy yeah. which they, the they, boy. They, yeah they, they do have names they do have yeah. names i uh, cannot remember any of the names they do yeah, have because some they, names. The, the names aren't like as important uh, like the the only name I, I I like remember like after having like just watched it was uh, Nonoko the little kid because this, she's she's, my, she's absolutely my favorite she, she she's fantastic, but this sort of structure where you like you give a theme and then you have like a few episodes and it is very common in traditional Japanese um, poetry anthologies so I think that's more what he's going for with that thing than trying to exactly represent the structure of a four coma manga in animated form. Oh, that yeah, makes sense. It, it it also ties into the minimalist aesthetic. It it, it has like a minimalist art style uh, and a minimalist uh, plot, <laughs> in a way. But but I I I I feel personally this is um this is probably like the only Isao Takahata work uh, I've seen that I didn't really jive with. Um, mm. I and and I think a big part of that is how. That minimalism doesn't really elevate anything. It uh, it, it doesn't make it um, make anything elegant in its stand out because like the whole story is about this family who are and let's not miss words about this a bunch of petty, small-minded, and forgetful like sort of assholes 
who like don't really throughout the movie. That's I think that's exactly one place where they show like some kind of like affection towards each other, and the rest is just like bickering and like dumb shit that happens because of clashing egos. Well, I think that's that's like the point of the film, though. They're like they're like the the average family in every sense. Like they're they're the complete, you know, uh, two children, uh, the older parent. You know, they're they're meant to be this very like not just abstract in their design, but like literally they are the abstract average Japanese family uh, yeah, in, but, in every yeah, sense. But... And that's why I, I think the minimalism stylistically yeah. definitely works a lot for it. Because again, we have these huge amounts of like negative space in the film. We get like a very also abstract sense of time as well, because we get a lot of references to like the fifties and sixties throughout, which maybe is just for Takahata, but also feels like it's trying to be this kind of like remembering the past, while also still uh, like for a modern audience, like um, even weird little references, like the the superhero he dresses up as is like a like a famous really early Tokusatsu hero that like the father would of course remember for his childhood. Yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah and I think, the, the, uh, later I think the, the all the references makes are meant reference. to be this. Yeah, they're meant to be this kind of like popular thing that like a lot of people watching the movie would remember, or even would remember their parents remembering. Yeah, yeah. so so, so it, it, it's, I, it's it's funny how that's like that's that that's juxtaposed with like a more generalized historical memory of where it's like so the, the kids are born through the, the the boy is born through the the peach as in Momotaro, and mm, um, mm. the um, the daughter is born like in the same way as Kakuyahime is born, and so it's like they're weaving these like cultural pop memories with a more. Um, like a, a more historical, high, quote unquote, high art um, Japanese um, conception of self in that way. Yeah, yeah, and and it's it's interesting, kind of, but but I I think it's uh, I I think that there's there's some like thematic disagreement I have with this movie. I I, oh, I, yeah. I think, and 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 that's a really good example. The way that that they're taking this um, n- n- nuclear family and uh, and and presenting them as like. Like this is just essentially how the world works. Yeah. Ish. Oh my god. And it's, yeah. and and never like challenges that in any meaningful way. Like there there could be an interesting film here where the family is actually challenged. Yeah. But like at the start of the film, we have this um we have this wedding sp- uh, speech uh, as mentioned earlier, which is like part of the framing device of, of, of the film. It starts out she she uh, she explains that uh as a married couple you're going to go through you got you will go through tough waters because life will be tough and that's when you uh, need to stay strong but what you also have to be careful about she says is uh the times of when the waters are still and there's no wind because that's when you don't have that like uh conflict keeping you together that's when you might drift apart or make dumb mistakes and this movie is very much about that still water part like there, there's no strong conflict and w- which is kind of why it's filled with these like little again petty squabbles which w- which are like relatable yeah but i think like the problem with the w- with the movie is that it, it it lacks that like actual conflict it, it lacks something really meaningful uh to to to, to say to in, in any way challenge the idea yeah. that this is an average normal family i think it mistakes um it mistakes the commonplace for the natural, and it it, it mistakes the traditional for the universal. Oh, you, this and, and, perfect. and that whole and that whole continuity with the Momotaro Kaguyahime myths into this like nuclear family of the uh, of, of 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 the like like the safe and comfortable but but sort of boring nineties. Yeah, I think that's I I, I don't really like it enjoy that i, yeah. I don't also uh, sorry l- just little side note uh, also an, an another intriguing thing um the the lady who reads out the wedding speech at the beginning is actually like a famous uh japanese comedian from the 60s as well um chocho miyako who would have been like very like a very household name so she's almost mm-hmm. like again that cultural thing of like passing down this advice like from a very familiar voice to like this kind of new generation like watching yeah. the movie so Played on in general, I really, really loved how you put most of those things there because they're exactly my feelings. I would maybe even go a little bit of a little bit further because I would say this movie seems to be actively endorsing and indulging complacency, which really surprises me when we view it as a Takahata film because 
all of Takahara's films, in my view, at least in our analysis, which you can also, uh, as 12 year uh, listeners, you can also check them out by listening to the other episodes we do on Grave of the Fireflies only yesterday, Pompoko. There is always a very uh, nuanced little analysis of society and like how society functions. We had uh, Grave of the Fireflies where Takahara critically dissected even like ideas of masculinity as they were normal at the time that Grave of the Fireflies was happening and showed what these ideas of what is like the essential masculine role uh, of like protecting the little girl and like this, even this isolationist principle of us, a family against the world, right? This we find the same principle of us against the world uh, in terms of the family in the same like bobsled or rather like going against the waves in that in that boat. But instead of being critical about it, and like Grave of the Fire Force was explicitly about how this isolationism and this not connecting and reaching out to the surrounding community is a huge issue for those kids. Suddenly this movie seems to really only be interested in depicting the family as the uh, distinct and close entity unto itself with very essential and very uh, uh, allocated roles and these rigid roles are supposed to be uh, treated as and seen as natural and uh, and then we have like only yesterday where we have uh, a taiko throughout the entire movie uh, contemplating the expectations of whatever is being put on her like the marriage that her mother wants her wants her to go into and her role in that city that she's growing up in that she doesn't really exper- uh, appreciate like this idea of alienation which is crucial to any kind of systemic analysis of like normalcy and hegemonic order of like society and how society is structured and how people on an individual level feel somewhat disconnected from what is like the commonplace but again Yamada's goes completely into the commonplace and i really need to stress this here yamadas has a very 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 strongly gender essentialist coding to everything the mother is a housewife when the man is comes home from work exhausted he just wants to watch sports but the mom wants to watch the sitcom because women watch the sitcoms and men watch the sports you know this is like I'm, I'm making it sound like a goofy example. Of course, we have examples in reality where this is exactly the case. However, the entire movie is coated in, a, uh, in, in exactly these assumptions being just what the characters are. And that is what Platon also said, like this idea of the abstraction or like the commonplace normalcy uh, confused with the natural. The movie reads only to me in a way where we can only see these very essential, very allocated, very traditional and very complacent positions in the family and the structure of the family as natural rather than just you know also relatable yeah uh, and I, I, I think especially like the uh near the end of, uh, of the movie it's it, it it's, it's not really like at some point it stops being relatable and starts just being kind of sad because if this is like how like you think like oh yes that's that's the family dynamic everyone knows this i mean that's that's a fucking sad state of affairs, honestly. And the work relation. The, I, I'm so impressed. Like, we all talked about how Takahara is a Marxist, maybe even more so than Miyazaki at this point, because Miyazaki has disavowed a lot of the earlier Marxist ideas and went for, in my opinion, something a bit more radical than even that. But um, Takahara has also always been a Marxist. However, in this film, we have, like, the salaryman father coming home from work completely shredded, destroyed, and exhausted. And the only takeaway from that is, que sera, sera. That's what life is. And, and and I find that upsetting and kind of frustrating to see because th- this doesn't fit with what I see Takahara doing. And I don't know what we're to take from it other than complacency. You are the patriarch of the family. That means you bear all the work, even if it destroys you. And in the same vein, and I have some a lot of empathy with the father figure here because the, the movie makes a point out of multiple, uh, at multiple points that he doesn't really live up to his own masculinity and that other characters just co- routinely make fun of him for it, right? He's not brave enough to stand up against the bullies because the grandma takes that over and he's like uh, the one supposed to work but he's sometimes a bit lazy and, and you know and not really yeah. assertive and then by the end when he gives a speech by the way the end is also marriage so it's framed from marriage to marriage marriage being this door this chapter of life that isolates you from community and everything around it simply focused on this one nucleus on this nuclear family so i already really dislike the framing through marriages as like the only avenue of life especially compared to only yesterday where this is exactly rejected but when he gives a speech at the wedding at the end suddenly the characters look at him and he said something smart 
uh, and 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 they were like, oh, so he can be a man after all. And that just really hit me in the wrong way because this movie does not seem to be critical about these ideas uh, at all. Like it seems to have just genuinely expressed the idea that, oh, he could man up after all. Like, I don't know if that's the standard we should measure it by. And this is the dividing line where it goes so far to say maybe it's not just complacent, but actually like kind of harmful in spreading that. Like this is this is so easy to fall for it, right? No, I, because I, I, I wouldn't go that far. Uh, maybe, but, 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 but this is like the kind of thing where I look at it and see, well, it is also relatable because of course we've experienced commonplace moments that bear similarity to these situations. But aren't we then maybe falling into the same trap of confusing the commonplace and the relatable for the natural and we might uh, overextend our analysis in terms of how we see this movie depicting reality rather than how reality actually is where none of these tropes and roles are as essential and as um, um, purely uh, traditional as reality would have them, right? At least that's that's my feelings. I have complicated feelings on the depictions in this movie, especially as part of uh, Takahara's uh, oeuvre. So he, he has, I think when my... it comes to the... Oh, sorry, do you want to go through? No, no, you can do it, Hipter. I was saying, when I think it comes to the, the masculinity aspect, I really think that it like really hits the nail on the head, what you were saying then, Yard, where the, uh, the little, the last scene of the movie, like the last couple of seconds, uh, is it, uh, they go, oh, we're, we're going to eat, uh, we're going to eat for dinner. And then they all like shout, shout a suggestion. And then the dad just like grumbles on ahead and says, no, I'm picking. In like a, in like a bizarrely like bitter tone. Maybe it was just the voice actor like reading that line that way, but it felt like such a weird note to end on, and like such one of like he's a scrounging for masculinity in the most like petty places possible with his family, just like what they eat for dinner. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I want to I want to speak to that real quick because um, Platon very early early on this the beginning of this part of the discussion, he said that um that um. Um, that that just comes at the end of the of the of the of the, of the boring safe nineties, which in Japan the nineties weren't safe. The nineties were like it came at the like this 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 is the the, the lost decade. This is the, this is after the stock market oh, right, crash. Yeah. This, is, this is after Japan. Japanese is economically like suffering quite badly. Their economy hasn't grown in ten years. They like you, if you see the, look at any Japanese media like like anxieties about the internet about like like modernization about the death of Japan as a you know a power in the world were like very very high and like. I, so I, I I think it's unfair to like try to um, characterize this within that context as oh it's just a it's a it's, it's a safe movie it's a it's a movie just about the world it's it's, it's because it's it's not a safe world at that time people are people are really scared and people are confused and so I think the goal of making a movie like this a movie, a movie that shows a you know a you know essentialized normalized family is more about um, depicting this kind of um, how do I say it like um. This 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 world that's like it, it, I mean it's contextualized in all like you know the Japanese history and Japanese literature and um you know and popular culture and like that that and the problem is of course like it, like it's centralized into okay this is how it always has been this is how it is but I don't necessarily think that's how that 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 that, that that's how it's trying to present itself because like there's there, there 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 I mean there's several scenes about like um um generational gap and like you know and how like that like is like alienating the characters from each other but like and you could argue that okay that's just the you know everyone has generation gaps that's a constant thing but that's that, when paired about with the anxieties of the time with um you know the father grumbling about like his like he gets to choose dinner about like all these essentialized traits that these characters do which don't help them I I think the movie very clearly presents all these traits as hurting the characters like like um I like, I disagree. I disagree because I think um, throughout the film, uh, the butt of the joke is also oh, it seems to always be like the characters not living up to expectations and either being ashamed of that or unaware of that in some way. And it's the butt of the joke is never the expectations as they exist. The butt of the joke is never the like limitations of the nuclear family as an ideal. It's always like when 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 the dad like is insecure about his masculinity. That's the joke. When he's uh, when he when he like tries to live up to it and doesn't, that's the joke. When the son like fails his exams uh, because he's 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 just not really good at studying, that's that that, that that's kind of it. Yeah, uh, it is the when, when, when the mom fails. Okay. When the mom fails to be the voice of wisdom as she's supposed, like the the grandma fails. Sorry, to be the voice of wisdom that she's supposed to be. 
That's the joke. Yeah, it is the and, uh, also uh, relatable yeah. thing where we point to or we reinforce a normalcy by pointing to little deviations from the normalcy where the point is we laugh about the deviation from normalcy yeah. rather than to uh, uh, dismantle the concept of normalcy yeah. as such. Uh, I, 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 I don't think the work is explicitly critical of the nuclear family, not at all. Like, I mean, that's, that's, I, you definitely can hold that as a criticism of the movie, but that's actually harmful. He, he, here's my problem. So I think of like the scene where the father goes and meets the bikers, right? Um, and he, he, um, the, the, first of all, the, the thing completely changes. This, this, this is the representation of like anxiety in the '90s. This is the re representation of like this fear of, of like crime. This fear, which, which, which I don't necessarily think was rising at the time, but there was definitely a belief that it was rising. There was a belief of in these kinds of like violent worlds and like that Japan has felt isolated from up to this point. Um, that they feel like in the loss of their you know economy, the loss of their culture in a way because like i mean you see this in other films at the time you see like a lot of like anxieties about the internet about english language taking over japan stuff like that but um a lot, a lot of these, these these anxieties are are there and like when he goes out and confronts the the um the he tries to play his role as the man though he i mean you could argue he's, he's forced into his role as the man because i mean there's the, the, the grandma like he's, he tries to convince his his mother not to go out his mother-in-law not to go and confront the bikers and uh, where he insists on doing so right um, where he's just on, he's just kids where he insists, 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 he says not, but she insists he go out and confront them. And so he walks out and like, you know, does, you know, does the average fail your masculine role. But what's interesting is, you know, and, 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 he, and his grandma has to come out and save him. Um, but what's interesting about this thing is a, the art style completely changes. So it's like the, the joke doesn't really work anymore when you have this perspective, like in the way the jokes in the, at this point have been, I, I feel like have been trying to express this kind of, um, it's kind of this. this, this they're trying try, try to take these like these serious issues and like you know throw like a oh ha it's funny. But in a way, what what happens after that scene is he sits down in the in the swing and just like with his helmet on and just sits there and just looks extremely upset. It's a it's it, it's a very clear reference to Ikiru by um uh, Hiro Kurosawa, um which is yeah, a, yeah with a swing set yeah. yeah. Which is you know, which is a movie about a a a person who's the most boring hegemonic um, fi figure who just does his job as a um as a government um, employee Bureau trying yeah, trying trying to do something good for the first time for one time in his life because he knows he's dying right so that scene really reflects it because in that scene he goes to this he sits on the seats and says wow I didn't I didn't do anything I failed my role and then he, he imagines himself as a hero like a superhero saving his family in this degree, which is, of course, the opposite of, like, actually, it's, it's, it's reinforcing this idea. But what happens at the end, instead of, like, it like being like, oh, how it's funny, it says, there's the, you, get the, you get the poem from Basho saying, um, how cruel a grasshopper trapped under a warrior's helmet. Yeah, which so, is a really... Which is, like... I, I, I like that poem. It's, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's so, I think... This movie, in, in 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 even though it has these really problematic ideas and these problematic like it's like you could argue essentializations of gender roles in the nuclear family, I think it does a really good job of capturing the anxieties and the um and the like realities of one tr living in this forced role. So I, I will have to. I say think that's a good point. This... I think that's a good point. But um, but but, but, but uh, and. Uh, and actually it illuminates maybe part of why I, I, I didn't really jive with this movie because you're right that there's this anxiety to it. Um, oh, yes. Like it, all, all, all the jokes aren't like huge, uh, like gut-busting uh, punchlines. It's it's always like just like so someone being like inadequate, like not living up to expectations. And there's like, and, and all, all of the characters are kind of like ha have these anxieties about it, especially the dad. Um, and, and, and in that scene, like there's, it's not really a joke that, that he's not masculine enough. It's just kind of sad. Yeah. And, and, and like you mentioned, it has that art style shift into that, like rotoscoped, um, where it was suddenly everything like is, is more like real and, um, uh, but, but, but at the same time, like uh, uncanny, like it, it, there's, there's an anxiety to the movie. But what I think is that it, the movie doesn't resolve the anxiety. Yeah. It doesn't yes. really address it in any meaningful way that's satisfying. The opposite. So what you're left with is a film that has like all, all, all like, like the, the structure, the uh, aesthetic, the like kind of the, uh, in, a, in a way, like the mood and tempo of like just a, a lighthearted little time with like a relatable, fun little family. But like underneath that, like the deeper stuff is all just just filled with like this 
strange anxiety that doesn't go anywhere. And, 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 it, I, and I think it, that's really it's, it's like just, just yeah. off putting. But in Platon, a way. it goes it, it, somewhere. The movie shows us where it goes. We start by setting out on the waves that crush against the boat, and the family needs to hold together to protect themselves from the world. And the end, uh, the message by the end, is the most complacent reaction I could ever think of to issues of gender, nuclear family, um, um, exploitation at the workplace, uh, being overworked, the en ennui experienced by the housewife. All of this is ended and concluded with, with que sera, sera. It, it is just what life is, and that is the, the point by the end of it. And and the, the speech by the end the father gives is what we need to keep in mind here. Like you will have these hardships, and as a family, you stick together and you come through to them, and that's all. That that's that's it. That we think about how this family in itself causes a lot of these issues. I think is what the movie misses out on extremely strongly. Because what is causing the extreme overwork of the husband? Well, because there's a patriarchal assumption that the man works and the woman stays at home. What is causing the ennui of the housewife? Well, the same. What is causing? you know, all these anxieties about masculinity. Well, exactly this traditional assumption, exactly this clear delineation of roles within the family that is only restricting. But the answer the movie gives us to all these restrictions and to recognizing that there are certain anxieties is the equ equivalent of grow up. Yeah, I, th I think one of the one of the most like uh, telling uh, scenes uh, when it comes to like this film's idea of like uh, gender and traditional roles is um in in the section with uh with the uh the son uh character when he um like he 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 get he gets this uh this girl who's like seems interested in him and uh, and he gets a phone call like to the to the home line because they don't have cell phones um yet and uh, and and like they uh the the mom and the grandma they hear that oh there's a girl on the phone for him so they they like sneak up uh, uh, on it and, and like try to listen in to his conversation there, and they like immediately afterwards they go up to him and are like, "Oh, his heart is beating so fast. Oh, does he have a girlfriend?" And the thing is, the joke right there isn't that that's a fucking dumb thing to do. Like, to, to be, like, don't be like that. That, that that's the that, that's exactly how you make it so your your kids don't talk to you about like their like new friends or romances and stuff like that because they get really weird about it really quickly mm. that's not the, the joke is oh people do this yeah well, isn't but, it but isn't also, it just relatable people do this it's it, it's such a thing yeah. that people do and also it expresses and, and like, like this extreme yeah. focus on just getting your kid married off like this entire movie this has one uh main raison d'etre life is about marriage about finding your partner and sticking with your partner the entire life and that's where it's embodied there. The <laughs> older women are so excited about this girl because in their worldview, this is the only thing that matters really, in a sense, right? And I, I find this really upsetting because, again, I talked about Only Yesterday. In Only Yesterday, we have explicitly, no, I don't want to marry. I want to find my own way of living, my own place to belong, my own reasons for existence and whatever, my, my own raison d'etre. This movie does not ask its characters the question of what do they want to do with their life. This movie posits an almost unavoidable thesis, and that is uh, marriage, uh, nuclear family marriage is the reason of life. That is what you do. Your family is excited for it. And when you talk to us, this, I don't know, I experienced this in my family as well, which I think has a very poor way of dealing with uh, gendered assumptions, which is always like... Um, just for context, I'm, I'm, I'm as a person asexual, so I don't intend to have children or marry. I have relationships with people, platonic, basically, but when the family approaches me and asks me things like, um, oh, when are you going to get married? I'm going to say, never. And my grandma just looks at me with puzzlement, like, this is not what you do. You do marry at some point. Like, why would you not marry? When will you have children? Never. Why? Children are the best thing. No. <laughs> people can make up their own life choices. This movie does not communicate this at all. Instead, the opposite is it is a natural assumption that it's all about marriage. Yeah. So I want I want to go back to the um, the the um, the speech he gives at the very end. Um, because one of the things when he's giving the things, oh, the, the, he's listing a bunch of things that can go go wrong, like can go can go badly, and like things you have to get through. And one of the things he mentions is actually is separation, which I thought I, thought, I think is pretty interesting because. Like his his wife is like, why would he mention say separation to a newly married couple? What is this? But um, um, which is you know it's just you know maybe he just say it's a funny joke. But 
I think it speaks to kind of what the movie's trying to do. Because in only yesterday, right, the, the goal is it's trying to produce a solution to modern alienation, right? It's trying to find a way one can deal with and one can individual ways, one can get through these these issues. Um but um this movie is not doesn't produce any solutions. It doesn't it, it it doesn't say it doesn't it doesn't say that you can solve any of these problems. It doesn't say that even these doesn't say these things are good necessarily. But it doesn't say there's any way to solve it. It's it's, it's trying to take a. I, I think what Takata talk about the beliefs he's doing, which I think there's many arguments we've made against it. Right, is that he's taking a camera and pointing at the family and saying, "Look, this is what it is." In all its bad and good, right? And he's like, when he says kisa, kisara, kisara, it's um. I think that you need to, to understand that in the context of what the teacher writes at the very end. When the teacher, when the teacher was asked, "Oh, what's your motto for life?" She says, "Don't work. Don't try so hard. Don't, 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 don't exert exa- yourself." Because yeah, don't overdo it. But yeah, be complacent. You, just, you, you can't because I, I, th- I think this movie is insanely cynical in that regard. I think like at the at the at the end at the end at the end of the nineties, like at the end of like this is like Japan is like at the lowest it has been since like the war. It's been like like I just the people just don't have a way of doing this. They just like well life is fucked, but whatever. Just try to be happy. It's all you can fucking I, do in this world. Okay, and that's, sorry, that's kind of how I see this movie. I cannot go with you in saying <laughs> this movie is cynical. This movie is a celebration and a depiction. It is it, not being cynical. It is not criticizing it is not you know i i don't have the sense it's, at all it's, it's, i don't i, I don't think think it's, it's, a, it's a celebration of the ability to be well, happy think, within this awful worthless world and that's how i see it i i, I think i think of uh of it this way i, th- I think thundy is right there that it uh, it's cynical but in the way that like um or, uh, anyone who's an optimist know that knows they're an optimist but like every pessimist think they're a realist so, so, like this movie thinks it's being like realistic about like, well, this is how the how, how things are, and 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 like we 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 can like we we can ch- uh, chuckle about it, but and uh, and uh, like k- kind of like uh, point at it and say, whoa, yeah, that that's uh, it, it's kind of a mess, but like that's life, and it does, uh, and it thinks it's being like real about it, but it's just like being cynical, and, and I think a real big part of that problem is that, uh, like. There's no like good part. Like there's very like like where the hell is the love, the compassion, the tenderness uh, between these people who like like but both like the like b- 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 between like the family uh, like the the parents and their children. Like it it doesn't come through in anything except like like token gestures. Yeah, I, and like the, the, I think there's exactly like I think there's one moment. Like maybe two in the entire film, where like they they show this like love and like and like affection for each other. It's um the 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 scene where the, the dad uh, is like walking home in the rain and he doesn't have his umbrella, so he calls them to see if they can get him one. And and all of them are like ah no, uh, and he he goes to buy one, and then he meets all of them at once, uh, meeting him in the rain. That's that's a sweet moment, like. Where is that in the rest of the movie? But I, I, I think there are many moments like that. Like I, I think of like the moment um, when the grandmother goes to the hospital, right? And like the, the, the woman she's visiting is. Um, oh, I really wanted she, to talk about that. She's, 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 she's like, she's like hooked, she's like hooked up to like a machine, like a, like a, a bag. What do you call those things? Like, a, like a water source. Um, yeah, an, an IV drip. drip. An IV drip. Oh, yes, 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 yes. That's. What, um, and she's like, she's like, but she, and, and the grandma comes like expecting her to tell her what the rest of it. And then she starts like gossiping about the other patients, talking about the food in the hospital, and then like, like, and after this long, like, like you know, I don't know. It's actually one of the longer sections. It's like you know, six or seven minutes, I think. Um, she like the grandma says, "Oh, so why are you in the hospital anyway?" So then the woman looks down, and, like starts like looks like she starts to cry, and then it fades away. And then there's a Basho poem, um, "No sign of death approach and the cicada's voices." And it's like moments like those, like it's like okay, we have to to deal with this like kind of like existential crisis that all these kids are going through. They have to like what they what they what they do is they you know they point oh they gossip about the other people, they talk about the food, they do these mundane things, these like. Perform these like social cultural performances that they've been taught are the things to do, because yeah. they can't deal with the fact that you know death is coming. That yeah, yeah, have- they, I, I think that's like really a- accurate. It, it it's sort sort of it, it's a, it's a really like surprisingly powerful scene in the middle of everything that I, I kind of hoped became like more of a thing in the movie, but like just 
sort of like just is like a thing that happened. Um, like <laughs> like the the idea of like we setting existential dreads aside through routine, uh, and and like the, this like complacent normalcy. I think that's a really interesting theme, and I wish the movie was about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I I think the movie kind of tries to reject being about most things. Again, like we say, it's just kind of like just shots at like this idea of the family so like you were saying Sandy that you think it's like um how do I phrase what you were saying you say it's it's, it's kind of cynical and looking at it uh, I kind of agree with uh Nyardmore where I feel like the framing at the beginning of the end is is too is too on the nose and too fantastical and too like um insanely over the top to like just write off as like oh that was just the theme like kind of there I feel like mm. you're right about the whole thing of marriage being like this this big adventure, this big thing that is your life, that is the most important thing. Because it's shown with such like insane bombast and like these uh, like fantastical sequences more so than anything else in the film of like at the beginning and at the end where there's a huge like it's a small world view of like the suburb they live in and like they're like flying umbrellas up through the sky and all this stuff. And it's like that's the, this is supposedly like the proper happy way that like life is and should be i feel like that's way that's that's way too framing it strongly to like uh just say oh no the movie's cynical about uh marriage and about the way things are well well like, like of, of course like the start of the movie isn't the conclusion like that's not that's not how movies are structured like like it's it, it's often like the ending is what like reveals what the movie was getting at and often like the movie is about the transition from where we were in the, at the start to where we are at the end but i was, so, talk, so I was talking about that the way, ending then... it's the exact same thing like it's yeah the, the movie is bookended by the two same sequences basically yeah. again yeah and, and the difference is like in the in the in the first sequence we get like you said this this like this grand idea of uh of of, of like um, married life as a as a journey with a destination and and you have to like uh, brave the waters and you have to not uh, be be too uh, complacent when there's uh, the still waters which as I argued earlier is what the movie's about these the still water time and what the, it concludes is um, that like it it's it's not like that uh it's uh w w which is is like a, a fine enough message on its own but like the way it's contextualizes i i i think is is the mistake because it 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 doesn't conclude like that you shouldn't put too high expectations on uh, marriage and then this like conflict based uh f framing is wrong no like like its conclusion is actually like acceptance and, and, and like complacency is actually good if you want to like it's not about like st uh, sticking together and going for a destination and it finishes with them drifting in the wind with those umbrellas not like going anywhere uh and i th I, th I think that's such a that's not a much better like idea to end on like ju just because marriage isn't this grand uh goddamn romantic adventure uh, through and through doesn't mean that it's actually just like boring everyday life that where you have to just accept how fucking shit it is sometimes. To be clear, I, I think I, 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 I don't I don't think that's a good message. To be clear, I think that the, I think you miscontextualized the, the um, original speech a little bit because she's not like this kind of oh marriage is a great wonderful thing. She's not saying anything like that because like she's no, no, about, no. Oh, she talks about oh saying that. Uh, but but which literally what she's saying is a. Family is useful because they're going to give you property. And B, and it doesn't really matter if you get married because children are going to raise themselves anyways and you don't really do anything with that. She literally says those two things in this original speech. So it's like, I, I don't know about the, that, 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 this framing that, the, that marriage is presented I, I, I would, in that speech. I would honestly say no, the, the language of the film is like way too over the top with this. Like literally this big epic sequence on like a boat and like finding... And then yeah. again, the children, though, I think it's like definitely a comedy juxtaposition where she says, yeah, yeah, oh, children raise the themselves or whatever. But the, the children are like literally them. Momotaro and Princess Kaguya, like two like beautiful myth children of like, you know, immense um, weight in them, like culturally. Yeah. So yeah. like, I feel also like the, the movie's general, language yeah. is far too strong just to write it off from like what like one of the characters yeah. is saying. There's this uh, there's this specific gag uh, I'm reminded of when we talk about that like uh, co comedic ju juxtaposition, where 
Um, it, it's a really short one. It's one of those like that takes like ten or twenty seconds, where uh, the, the 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 dad that they're sitting at at, at like the uh, at dinner table uh, having tea or something, and the, and the dad like looking at his newspaper uh, p- uh, puts out his ha- hand and uh, no 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 he, he's he's not reading the newspaper. He he he, he puts out his hand towards uh, the mother and and, and it's like a, a here, and and she hands him a cup of tea, and and the son is like oh look at that. That's what like uh, twenty years of marriage does. Like you, they're so in sync, and like immediately it turns out like no, I wanted the newspaper. What the hell are you doing? And she's like, I'm reading it, and that's yeah. like that's the that I think that's like one of the stronger like juxtapositions is this like grandiose and mythical idea of like what a marriage and a partnership is versus like the sometimes kind of like uh, boring kind of petty reality. I think that's a good joke. I don't think it can carry an entire film. I do not think that. I agree. <laughs> so, I feel like at this point, we've mentioned it quite a few times, but um, they, we have an interesting structure of vignettes being framed by marriages, and we have Basho. So, uh... Yeah, what, what the hell is Basho, yeah. and, and what are these weird calligraphy things that t- show up sometimes, my, and then My favorite they say hunter, something. hunter character, Basho, the, the poetry guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you remember him from the York New York. Okay, so I mean, Basha's not, not, not the only poet. There's also Busan and one other who I don't remember off the top of my head, but Basha's definitely the most prominent. Um, Basha was a poet um, during the Edo period in Japan, um, like the like uh, roughly equivalent to like Renaissance, like like early modern Japan. Um, and um, he's, in, he's 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 like in a way like the most canonic Japanese poet. Like he's like like the Shakespeare of. Japan in a way in like terms of just like council um, recognition and just everyone knows his poems and they just appear everywhere um, but like the two f- the, he, he, he um, helped pen a couple of, f- first of all he was most famous for his um, um, Haikai no Renga or um, which is basically this type of it's linked verse poetry as we know it in English is this kind of poetry where you basically it's um, collaborative poetry you, one person will write a, um, a, part, a, a part of a poem and the next person will finish it leaving up a chain of poems to, where you basically you're trying to use the words and the ideas in it to um build on the other person's poem and you go back and forth maybe with one two three four five six seven different poets and you get, until you get a hundred um poems down um and that's and that would be a that that, that would you, you that would be a finished work um and this is um interesting in regards to um a little bit later um takata in 2003 i think worked on the um collection the short collection um fuyu no hi or winter days um which is a, basically just a adaptation of an actual real life renga that did that, that happened, but in into like an animated form. And in um, in um, in, in Takahata's um, contribution to the shore, he did one, one of the one of the little animation um, bits. He is basically just about this like this like Japanese um, looks like like hey and era monk, looking like he's like really concentrating and writing like some like thing really big. And then you see him like. And then you just see him like, like just like, and then 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 it, then it, then it cuts to a, a toilet flushing and him like typing like an ah as he just like you know just he just, he just poop because like that's actually what was happening. Uh, um, that's that's the joke and that's that's that's, that's the short. Um, and it ends with a, a, a <laughs> that's like the entire short. Yes. Um, and it ends, and ends, it ends with the toilet like like just like water like just like <laughs> swirling back and forth with a leaf in the middle of it. And that's the other most important um, Basho innovation is um. His, I'm not sure if he was the first one to do it, but he was one of the first people be able to use in Japanese literature and poetry that you were only allowed to use certain words. About a thousand words were allowed in poetry until the Edo period, um, when they added three new categories of words: rude words, Chinese words, and I don't remember what the third word off the top of my head right now because I couldn't find my notes um, on him. But um, but this like whole juxtaposition of you know this 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 leaf, which is a very clearly a you know it's 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 it, 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 I'm I'm not sure exactly what it's referenced to, but it's 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 clearly like a seasonal reference of some kind, and it's like this like you know very like traditional Japanese word floating in a toilet, which is a very you know a rude word thing. It's a it's a it's a, pe- it's a peasant idea. So it's like there's this juxtaposition of um of this you know kind of like mythologized Japanese pure poetry with this these um these rude scatological and like peasant like um um humors and like words. And I think this kind of this 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 kind of linked verse structure can be and um these these rude and these these rude juxtapositions can be um like mapped onto this movie pretty well, where like 
even though the poems are are just haikus in themselves, well, I mean, basically, a ring, a, a, a Rengo is just a, a bit, almost like just a bunch of haikus strung together in like a hundred haikus strung together. Not quite that, but it's similar to that. Um, and what the but the movie kind of does it strings all these um these um these um little vignettes together in this kind of oh they're related like there's there's some element in every vignette that relates to the next vignette and so and instead of like trying to craft a sort of um 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 continuous like like oh here's a story that goes from within it instead it's just the one element that com- that you can see that is um that represents the the what the, the one element you can you see that um they share between one vignette and the next, and then you go to the next vignette, and maybe the third vignette and the first vignette may have absolutely nothing to do with each other because the um, things that connect them maybe weren't weren't were even just abstract, vague abstractions, maybe not even thematic ideas, and it's like that's kind of just how Renga are, are structured and how this this film is structured as well. Um, and it does this while juxtaposing stuff like you know you know mythologizing Japanese culture and history, you know stuff like Momotaro and um and and um Takitori Monogatori, um, with um these kinds of you know rude family like these like quote-unquote peasant ways of approaching the world so it's like the whole work feels like it's structured around um basho's um um Bas- basho's love of um of haika no renga and of of putting just put, putting work together in this way which i think i think is a really interesting way to structure a a, a um a um work of, of a movie because it's um, yeah, yeah, it's, it, it, it's an interesting and novel way to structure a film, is <laughs> especially like when you're used to like Western uh, film, and that, that that's that's something I do appreciate about uh, a, a Japanese film, not just in animation, that that it has this rich uh, artistic tradition that's so divorced from the yeah. Western stuff that we take so yeah. so much for granted, oh. uh, and, and that often adds a lot. But I honestly. I think there's a reason why that this type of structure isn't as common in film. Um, I think there's there's a reason why it's it's not used. There's um, one, what there's one more element of Basho I think is important to remark in this movie. Um, Basho's most famous work is called is 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 is, 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 is most famous collection of poetry is called Long Road to the Interior. Where basically Basho is like I'm just gonna walk around because traditionally in Japan until like Basho people would they, instead of just um right instead, instead of going to places and describing them people would read about events in like Heike Monogatari or um or um um, um Genji Monogatari. Um my favorite monogatari's um <laughs> or <laughs> Yeah, or, you know the cl- the OG Monogatari oh, series. Or or Tori <laughs> Monogatari, you know, all all all, 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 the, all the all the old like Japanese like, you know, kind of works which describe events in many scenes. Specifically Heike Monogatari is the most important issue. If you, I, I, I haven't seen the, the Pump Uncle cast, but I assume you guys talked about Heike Monogatari because a lot of the scenes from that reference Heike Monogatari very explicitly. Um, we have. But so the Heike Monogatari. Heike Monogatari. Yeah. Uh, that's, 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 I'm sorry, we, you, you weren't there. <laughs> you, you couldn't save us from our ignorance of uh, Japanese cultural history. Right. I'm that's, sorry. That's kind of sad. But um, um, and in Heike Monogatari is basically a, a big event. It's sort of of all these historical events um, where they these characters um. I'm a little going out of context, but basically, these all these events would take place in these like scenes, and people would write tons of poetry about these like scenes, these 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 these, these like these places without actually going there. Where Bosch is like, oh no, I'm just gonna walk around all of Japan and describe every important scene in Japanese literature, every important this, every important like area, and how I um, um, view it, but through the lens of my juxtaposition of rude and you know traditional pure quote unquote pure Japanese um, um, work, and so. It, 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 he, he very much believed himself as this kind of like objective way. He, he's trying. He's trying. He was trying to instead of just relying on a cultural tradition, he wanted to describe the things in as they are to then properly relate them to the context of Japanese cultural history without leaving them as just these pure worshipped idealized areas. Which I feel like is almost the goal of the movie itself. It's trying to take. It's trying to look at. All these events, trying to take these like rude understandings of the world, juxtapose them with these like you know more you know you take you take you take Japanese literature and the Japanese traditional literature and you mix it with you know references to tokusatsu heroes and you, and you, and you and then, then you just look at them you just like you take you take all these scenes and you try to understand them through your cultural like framework, um, but not just as a pure um, from afar. Observer, but someone who goes up and really studies them and tries to understand. I mean, I, 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 I just, 
I think that's why Takahata structured it that way. So I can see the structural similarities, but what strikes me as like not quite fitting is if we have this uh, style of trying to depict a more objective reality through juxtaposition as well, through like having the literary be invaded by the Volga, by the peasant language, as you said. But even then, don't we feel like this movie has too much of a thesis statement to not be completely subjectively colored by its own thesis? Because with this, the opening thesis leading into the end thesis, which is the yeah, marriage that's... into the marriage with this one speech into the next speech. And those make a point about those observations we just made. So instead of just leaving us with the juxtapositions in themselves to um, make us realize something out of these juxtapositions that may be a form of objective or critical or whatever uh, like uh, not particularly flattering juxtaposition between uh, Volga and uh, uh, literary instead we have it framed with a thesis statement instead we have it like leading to a point that is yeah. being made that kind of takes away from just giving us depictions of something real something that we yeah. can find our meaning of, out of and I definitely think that's the worst part of the movie I, I would I would definitely agree. I I think I think that that's destructive because um Takahata said himself like he, when he was trying to adapt it he just didn't understand he was, he, he I think he ha he generally like had this he wanted to to um have some kind of like you know frame advice he didn't want to just like you know straight adapt a bunch of comic strips because that wouldn't make sense in a movie um movie standpoint but so he and he, and he said that he would he would he would he would direct these these um these scenes and he was like there was there was something missing from the rhythm. Which is why he, which is why he originally got the idea to put the um, Basha Busan poems in, as a way of like you know punctuating the the um, the rhythmic feel and the thematic feel of what any scene meant. So yeah, I I I, I think while the movie I think is extremely well constructed from this kind of like scene to scene perspective, I I think the framing device is destructive to a lot of that meaning. Yeah, I would agree. I th I, th I think another. Um... Uh, another thing is like w once again uh, it, it it comes to like what you uh, point at and declare this is normalcy this is Japanese life yeah oh, yeah, um, yeah yeah totally yeah be, 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 because like at, like I'm 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 guessing that that like when you decide what to write haiku about you look at what yeah like you you, you find like uh beautiful or like uh, quintessentially like well, uh, Japanese well that, that, that was kind in, of in terms of Basho, right that was kind of the point of Haku of, of, of Basho. he was not trying to just look at what was beautiful mm. he was trying to be more clear he would he wanted to just present things as they are that was that was his that was kind of that, I mean that's why he yeah, used yeah, the yeah. Vulcan okay. language um it, yeah. in that case like it, it's it's um I, I could put it this way like things as they are is a is a subjective yeah so, yeah, yeah, so, of course, uh, and, yeah and what you declare to be the, how things are does say something already before like before you start like yeah. when you when you've pointed the camera at this uh, like the proverbial camera obviously it's an animated <laughs> film when you've pointed your camera at the these subjects yeah of you've already said that these are like represent what i want to point my camera at yeah yeah so, um I agree. and that is i i think um like uh my core problem with this movie um like se setting aside all like the gender essentialism uh, uh which uh obviously is problematic and, and it feeds into um, what you just said i mean that yeah and, yeah and and the weird anxiety that isn't resolved and the um and, and the little themes that don't go anywhere um my biggest gripe with this movie is the why like that that's what really baffles me and annoys me about this movie honestly and and i like i really re I, I respect like, like uh, is, is especially from like what i've learned from you today uh thunderer that like i respect the ambition i respect the artistic achievement that it is like with the art style and the animation how it all works together it's it's impressive in that way so like I, I, it's it's not like i hate it i just like mm. so um yeah the why because like Isao Takahata at the like, as like the uh, directing some of the like the best tradition like two D animators in the world, perhaps of all time, at uh, like, at, at at the height of his powers essentially like like uh, Ghibli is a hit making machine. Mm. This is the movie that he, like that that had to be made. Um, there's some um, and 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 that. Uh, really bothers me especially because like I, I really love movies and, and i love them especially like the craft of it and, and 
screenplay is also a type of craft and you can forego a lot of the like screenplay rules and i talked a lot about that in the uh, uh my neighbor totoro uh, cast that where uh miyasaki really like threw the plot out the window but like made up for it with this like magical mono no aware, um which like c- couldn't have otherwise been there in this case structures uh, the, the structure is kind of absent and in its place seems in my opinion like in my view at least to be basically nothing like it what what it says at the end of it all is like this weird message about complacency being a, a good thing actually which like who who needed to be told that so what why what do these characters learn what do they go through and like obviously response to that is like oh well the entire point of the movie is that that's what every day is like like people don't go through this like a, once again, this image of the great, grand, tumultuous waters, which isn't what marriage is, and I'm like, fine, but why did you just waste two hours saying that not nothing really happens? Um, like it, 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 it what what came to mind when, when I was thinking about uh, this movie for for the cast is um, is this uh, amazing scene in um in uh, adaptation, the um, uh, the, the the Charlie Kaufman uh, film. Um, which which is like a, a meta movie uh, about Charlie Kaufman trying to adapt this uh, this uh, this like strange nonfiction novel in, into a movie, um, and uh, and he has a lot of trouble because like he he has all the these anxieties about uh, about things and also he has this weird artistic idea that that like no no th- th- this should reflect the the, the like sort sort of meandering real tone of the book because like reality sometimes like. It just re- reality isn't filled with like dramatic character arcs and like uh, great revelations. Often, like it's just like frustrating and weird. Um, and he can't write this thing, and he gets so desperate he goes to a writing seminar, um, uh, uh, like uh, which is uh, where Brian Cox plays. The, he, it's based on a real legendary like screenwriting seminar guy, and he uh, during one of the courses he asked that question. He's like. Hey, so so you're talking about all, all all these like you know rules and do it do it like this because otherwise you'll bore the audience stuff like that. Um, but what if you just want to like make reality where it's sometimes it's just frustrating and and a real reflection of of real life. And Brian Cox's character, his response is like, first of all, you're going to bore your audience to tears if if, if you make that kind of movie. But second of all, a, a reflection of life. Like, have you taken a take a look around? Every goddamn day, someone somewhere is murdered. Every day, someone falls in love for the first time. Every day, someone makes a decision to cast away their life to save another. Every day, someone goes hungry. Every day, uh, s- someone realizes their love was a lie. Every day, someone um leaves uh, uh someone for their be- uh, for their best friend instead every day that like just look around like if if you want to make films if you want to make these stories these em- like these machines of empathy why are you wasting our time pointing it at something that doesn't matter i, I would just say and that's <laughs> my problem with this movie and, and and I would just say that you know the everyday things that don't matter can be the most beautiful, sad, and funny. You, yes, you they can, they it, can. folks. Plate and hands, Moe shows. And, and, you can't stand slice yeah, alive. Fucking slice fucking alive. Burn them down. Yes. And, I am officially and, and, withdrawing my ten out of ten score for K. I'm fa- and, no, and, that's and, not and, what I'm and, saying. Worthless. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying that's like the core of uh, of screenwriting. And if you forego that, you need to be really careful, and you need to know why you forego it and what. Like, like, and replace it with something of like value, and I don't think the things that like are re- it, are replaced by has like the like the value it needs to have. Like, it's it, it's it's not it doesn't have the like uh, t- transcendent niceness of my neighbor Totoro. It does uh, it it doesn't have the um l- like the uh the, the the in-depth and charming character work of something like Kon it 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 just has a bunch of like a, a family of 
uh, of like petty assholes who are like k- kind of just like inadequate and either aware of that or uh, or unaware of that, uh, and and, and that, that that's just about the joke, and they they don't learn anything, and there's no like dramatic question that gets answered throughout the movie, and there's no stakes, and there's n- it just feels like it doesn't like achieve anything by the end. It feels like a movie that I really don't understand why this movie had to be made. Playtown, by the way, thanks for for this, because it reminded me of a video that I was planning to make, then forgot to put on my list that I was planning to make it, ah. and then never remembered to plan to make it. Um, it is a, a video about how exactly Hidamari Sketch pulls this off masterfully <laughs> and doesn't fail at the thing you described as uh, My Name is Yamada's uh, failing at. Uh, uh, so that's just an aside. Otherwise, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much there with you so i i'm always a bit more careful when it comes to making the strong prescriptive claims of what screenwriting has to be to function but in the, the way you phrased it then made sense to me that if you deviate from some uh sensible rules of what of kind of things you want to depict then it needs yeah, to drama. be uh in a, in a sense uh done carefully and like with a good direction in the sense of why it is that you deviated from the rules so um I always like uh, go careful around like statements like this, but I feel like this is this does make sense. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I uh, I immensely disagree. Uh, I thought the movie, yeah, like nothing nothing really like happens. But I don't I don't believe there's some sort of like weird grandiose uh, idea that it like needs to hold. Like it 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 does it does everything it's it's trying to be. It's like this quaint little story of uh, a family that's like very like average and typical and. Uh, basically just like a sitcom but like done as a movie which like i say the, the the plot structuring is immensely weird for a movie but like this is essentially what would have otherwise been like you know a, a 12 episode four minute episode each um like tv show that they just like kind of rammed into being a movie and well, i don't really uh, have a problem uh, with it like the yeah, the, the and, quaintness and, and, and the in relatability that of the it does uh, gain, little it, it characters does gain something in, in the animation and stuff like, like, yeah like, like if anything it just and looks and better for that. it which i which i appreciate and there's a real like dedication to bringing all the little pieces of it to so, life in a way you would you would never really but, 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 see with any other kind of like small budget little but i, th- I think that brings shorts. us i think that brings us back to like the first bit of analysis we did which was like okay uh, i mean i guess there is value in just doing a, st- a story about average people in the average life. But once again, we get back to the question, who is average? What is common? What yeah. is relatable? What is normal? And what do you say about it? And the, and, and we have been prob- like, uh, we've spent a lot of time problematizing um, the, the uh, what um, my name is the, uh, the Yamadas really like is, is, is saying and what it's pointing at. Yeah, I, I think. But yeah, this I don't, is, I don't, so I don't disagree with that. that. I, I would, I wouldn't say that the movie is like my politics at all, or like that I agree <laughs> with most of what it's saying. But you know, that doesn't really bother me. I think it's still kind of a charming movie that uh, I've enjoyed seeing multiple times now. Yeah, so I, I, I have I to wish say, I think it flows very charming, well. I think, as again, as bizarre as the pacing is, all the scenes actually like flow pretty well, and the the poems like, uh, you know, like capping off each little segment works really nicely. You could almost watch this movie just in installments. Or like if you were just waiting for a bus, you could just like yeah. get your phone out and see what <laughs> I, I actually wait until the next poem comes up, and then yeah, just yeah. I I actually watched this uh, on on a train ride home, um, be, uh, be, be, be because of like uh, the the recording schedule, and I wanted to get get another rewatch in, but I I was like uh, traveling, so uh, and I, I will say hands down, yes, this is the Studio Ghibli film that you can watch on your phone without like missing out on the experience in any way so uh, um yes it, it is it is it, it very much lends itself to that that you couldn't do that with like the detail uh detailed scenes and other of these movies where you really want the big screen and the big sound and uh, really hyper focus on it but what i wanted to say and, and i don't know if I, can, if I can develop this connection quite perfectly but i think like what we point out platon when we talk about like complacency normalcy and how the the uh, commonplace 
or the the cliched i want to even say uh, becomes naturalized i think this is heavily related to this kind of structure too right so if the movie sets out with the goal of depicting reality in a mundane not conflict driven way literally as the movie outlines itself we're talking about the, the 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 phases of life where there's no wind where you're just stuck together then the movie as you said earlier right claims that what it is pointing the camera at is the natural is the normal so this structure of nothing much is happening no big conflict is happening kind of reinforces why exactly i find that the let's say political family dynamics gender issues strike me so much harder i guess because it really does through this structure that you criticize on a narrative level also reinforce aesthetically its reality i guess what it says about reality and this is really like the intersection where i think like all of our criticisms like align in this one point yeah and, and, and the, what what uh, again I, I don't hate this movie i'm i'm frustrated by it yeah, in many okay. ways uh, because uh, what what you say hipster i i really wish i could enjoy it the way you do like because yes there are there are very charming scenes. The art style is fantastic. The character designs are like really really well done uh, and well animated. And that and there are these vignettes that that I re really enjoy and, and that like show this like potential for the power the movie uh, could have. Like chief among them, the the scene with the grandma and her friend at the hospital, um, and like. But 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 all, but all that charm gets uh, uh, to to me anyway gets like undermined by how like how how little like tenderness and genuine care that it shows between the family members. Once again, they're they're all like petty, uh, inadequate assholes uh, throughout the film, and there's only like a couple of like breaks from from that dynamic, uh, which like undercuts in its charms in a way, and. Uh, and it's really cool to have this um, th this structure based in like a, a, a classical Japanese poetry uh, forms, but like when it privileges this, the, a very specific idea of uh, of the normal and relatable, that sort of gets undermined as, as well. So so it, it's all these elements that like when when they get put together into this story, I think just like don't come together well enough to to like to for the parts to carry each other and and, and i think that that's uh, that, that's really sad because like that there, there is a lot of interesting stuff to the movie like that, that's why we've been talking for for like a, an hour and change uh, about it and and there, there's uh, interesting stuff to look at how for for example like uh, isao takahata's films are very interested in the problems of like living from day to day um whether whether that uh that be like uh, living day to day in a situation where you're at war and you're starving uh in grave of the fireflies wh whether it's like being unsatisfied with uh daily life in the city and going to the countryside and only yesterday um and uh pompoko of course like the every the your everyday life getting destroyed by uh by like rapid industrialization and um and and your culture like gradually disappearing and uh, and of course uh, the tale of the princess Kaguya, his uh, his absolute masterpiece, which, which is all about um, the the search for happiness through like uh, like through through like life. Uh, it's it's an entire life story, which is which is uh, I, I look forward to talking about that one. Um, but and, and really interesting, I think Yam, uh, my neighbors the Amadas is like j just f f feels like a, a kind of a waste in that department. I think he had much better films in him um and i don't think this is uh, one of his good ones amen brother all right so don't worry this definitely won't be the worst studio ghibli movie we cover though no no, no again, <laughs> I, I don't hate it Ooh. i'm uh, i'm i'm disappointed and frustrated by it but like that it's it's like there are again a lot of like vignettes that work. Uh, there's a lot of technical stuff. The sound in this movie, I, I like. We completely skipped over that. Yeah, like, I, I think this is has some of the best like sound editing and, and like sound direction in, in any studio Ghibli film. And really yeah, like, so I noticed that again, like so with, is, the, with the animation, yeah. like every little thing in this movie is like really detailed and like really thought out. Like even though like the way like they move like the cupboard doors or something, like you yeah. notice all these little 
bits of animation and they sound everything out just perfectly. Yeah, exactly. It's it, it's what gives the, this minimalist uh, aesthetic uh, makes it feel real. Is is when 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 the, when those like uh, the six um, like six uh, straight lines moving around, which is a car. When when it, when you hear it going down the freeway, you know, like like you 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 can kind of like see exactly where we are and what it's trying to convey. I, uh, yeah, just wanted to mention uh, because like the discussion kind of winding down. The sound of this movie is uh, really really great. It is, and the music as well. Um, I I found the the, the, the of kind of stylis- stylistic <laughs> flourishes with like the the youthful female vocals very. Uh, charming i i have no better commentary on the music other than it's it's quite a good soundtrack <laughs> yeah so yes yeah, so, 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 so once again it's just like these s- uh, insanely talented craftspeople uh g- given direction by a by a, a, a true like visionary and i'm i'm i'm, I'm just ki- kind of sad that it like it didn't become more than the sum of its part. I, th- I think it's like uh, kind of less than the sum of its parts. Can you imagine? And that's sad. Can you imagine like what, I don't know, Stanley Kubrick making Garfield the movie and it is like a second to last film? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's so weird, right? It, 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 it's like if like George Miller, after directing like iconic action movies like Mad Max, um, went, went, went like, okay, I'm, now I'm going to direct like a, a children's animated film. That would be yeah. strange. Oh, wait, that happened. Could you, ma- could you imagine if Ridley <laughs> Scott not? <laughs> yeah, happy feet and ha- ha- happy feet too. I was going to say, could you imagine Ridley Scott, who made some like iconic cinema classics, then made a bunch yeah. of like bad trash movies that no one liked? Could you, could you, uh, could you imagine? <laughs> wow. <Yeah>. Okay, <laughs> that's wonderful. Yeah. So, so yeah, this is one of the like strangest blips in a in a like fil- filmmakers uh, career but i i i think um i think at le- least this podcast episode has kind of like given me some new context and i can i can now better see it as part of isao takahata's like uh work um just it's uh like i i, I guess you, <laughs> you you can't win them all i guess in in all honesty, I feel like part of the making of this movie was like he wanted to make a movie for old people because he's like you know anime it's mm. like a thing for young people they don't really get it or all the all the old people don't really get it they don't know it so I'm just gonna make a movie about like a family and they like reference things from the sixties hopefully that will get them in the seats you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> it may just be that I don't know I mean it's the newspaper comic strip and who reads those not the kids except if they're bored on the toilet yeah. As we can see from this movie, it's the salaryman dads. Oh, yeah. They read the newspaper. They do. Every morning. And the mom, too. A bit. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> well, at the, at the very least, all the techniques that, like, visual and storytelling techniques they use in this movie are all used again in Kagehime to a yes. I think, much, much better effect. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Certainly. It's, uh, <laughs> that, that, that movie is, like, it, it's one of my favorite movies of all time and my favorite uh, Studio Ghibli film. And uh, if this was, like, the stepping stone to get there, like, uh, w- w- with, uh, like, a- a- artistically and or thematically, then, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's very much worth it. Like, no hate. <laughs> true, true. And, well... But we'll get to that much later. Much, much, much later. Um, actually, the next one. What is going to be the next one? Spirit Away already, right? Spirit Away, <laughs> yes. Which is oh my god, that's another one. <laughs> quite, yeah. quite an endeavor. That's another we one. We probably of... won't have much to say on that one. That probably yeah. be pretty yeah. 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 That's going to be a short one. one. <laughs> that Listen, mean. we went three hours on fucking Mononoke Hime. Uh, Spirit Away. Uh, it can only be more, honestly. Oh my god. Um, it is the other really, really big one. I and I think like looking at like the 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 upcoming episodes like uh, uh, along the lines of the release order of the Ghibli movies Spirit Away is the big one until Wind Rises and Kaguya Hima so that's like the entire 2000s where I think well, even House of the doesn't quite fill the boots of like a Mononoke Hima and Spirit Away in terms of what the podcast there's, will demand of us I believe I mean maybe I'll be there's proven also, there's wrong also, there's, also, there's, there's also Ponyo 
Um, do you think Ponyo is like gonna be a huge big one in terms of like the 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 tremendous amount of reading and so on? Like, I've, okay, maybe we'll see. We'll see, right? We'll discuss it then, <laughs> and we'll let you, the listeners, know. But yeah, the next one is gonna be Spirit Away, and I'm really looking forward to that one. Holy shit, that's gonna be an episode. Uh, yeah. That's a big chunk. Of oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to be uh, gobbling up research uh, like there's no tomorrow and offering people gold pieces yeah. for them. Yeah, start researching <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so while this one, Yamada's marked like a little breather in terms of, I guess, researching for us because most of our research consisted of looking for something and not finding anything, Spirited Away is going to be quite the opposite. So let's see how we can make a manageable podcast out of that. But I think this wraps it up for uh, uh, the Yamada's cast today, unless anyone has still any further comments on the movie. I'll take that as a no. So I'm going to... This movie was good. That's my comment. <laughs> movie good. See, I... I, I the movie good, yeah. Well... Yeah. Not good movie. Uh, movie not good. I think, but hey, we talked about it. We talked about it. It's fine. Uh, we can we we can have a disagreement on this show and uh, still talk about why a movie is interesting and what interesting yeah. things it has to offer for us to talk about and analyze. What are you talking about, Nyad? Obviously, what everyone's here for is the numerical score we always give at the very end of the episode, <laughs> so everyone can just skip to that and miss the entire yeah, discussion. Exactly. That, that's <laughs> all that matters. <laughs> okay, so wonderful. I Joyful. Did you say anything? Uh, no, go on. Okay, then I want to thank everyone who's listening for uh, uh, entertaining our uh, analysis of this movie and hopefully you took something away from it. I will also encourage those who liked uh, what we were talking about, maybe want to talk some more about it, uh, to join our Discord server, which is a link you can find in the description of the video. And if you are listening in the future, now I'm addressing the future people who will listen to the podcast episode on Spotify or iTunes or whatever once it's up there, I don't know if I can put a Discord link in the description, so go find us on YouTube. Uh, you just search for the Nausicaas or my name, Nyad, and you will find a channel where you can have the descriptions with a link in them. I really have no idea how it works. But not only do we have a Discord where you can come hang out with us and talk to us, and uh, uh, which is hopefully going to be soon a growing, bustling, bustling community. We're, currently, it's not very much happening in there, but I hope that we will get there. And we have a Patreon as well. If you feel like you want to support this podcast, uh, want to help us pay the bills for keeping the podcast episodes hosted on uh, all the streaming sites that have podcasts and uh, 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 tech and just support us in general, please head over to patreon.com slash Nausicast. It's Nausicast with double A, not with the umlaut A. Eh? And other than that, I think we'll see you in the next one, which is going to be Spirited Away, as we already talked about. So, uh, goodbye. Bye. And, and yeah, and remember, que sera sera. Yeah. A joyful laughter breaks the silence of an autumn eve. Don't Bosh. overdo it. <laughs> 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 this podcast is structured like a Basho poem. Go back through it, you will find it. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, planned all along. <laughs> I, th I think that actually might be overdoing it. Yes. <laughs>